Hi, and welcome to the Secret Staff Meeting. This is where we have big conversations about education. So the format of the conversation is always the same. First question, what were you like at school? Second question, what's the point of school? And then the third question, which is, give me three things that you wish was taught in school. And we're looking for big conversations, big topics there. What's your name and where'd you come from? My name's James Frith. I'm the Labour MP for Bury North and I was elected in 2017, the snap general election of 2017. Okay, so um, for those people who don't know a great deal about you, I have a few little notes here because I've been doing some digging on you. Okay, um, digging, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you've got, um, you're, a, you're the founder of a social enterprise yep. in career and education guidance. Do you want to give us a little bit on, on that? Sure. Uh, so at a time when the government was doing its utmost to decimate the careers service, um, I launched a careers education company, a social enterprise that tried to put the careers guidance or did put the careers guidance person back in the school. It's not enough simply to point at websites and tell young people that there's a lot of information to go and find. Actually, it, the real job is helping them navigate uh, the right course for them. So yeah. uh, we, we created a, an organisation that did just that. So I remember my, my own careers advice back in school and it was a computer programme and we went on and we answered 40 questions and I was told that I would be excellent as being a fish farm manager. And how's that going? And you, you, you begin you begin so. you begin when in fish farming. So uh, maybe when I hit forty. That's exactly it's not yet, exactly. I, look, I think um, I think young people should absolutely expect better guidance and better yeah. careers education at yeah, school than, than than very often they they receive. But also this speaks to a wider issue about what we want from our education system and whether young people at the end of it um, are deemed to have succeeded and go on and contribute to wider economic and societal life. And I think that starts in the school with what we expect of them there. Yeah, and I think th this is one thing that people um, kind of should know about you, I guess, is this sense of social justice that you've got. So yeah. where did that come from? That comes from the fact that I've had a fairly um, privileged background myself. Um, I was considerably unwell as a, as a child, but got access to a very loving, family, was in a loving family, got access to a lot of repeat opportunity in my life. And I think this talks to a principle that I've spoken about on the Education Committee and elsewhere about a system that is designed not for everybody just to have one shot equally, equality of opportunity is important, but actually building on that repeat opportunity because young people develop at different stages, there are different life experiences that we all endure. And I think as a uh, as a career uh, education system, sorry, uh, we need to make sure that our young people are given repeated access to opportunity, mm. repeated access yeah. to inclusive education. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll go into more detail on that later, but I think that is it, I've never heard that phrase before. That say that again, repeated inclusive repeat opportunity. Yeah, I mean that is really interesting because, like you say, people do develop at very different times, don't they? And I think hundred percent. Yeah, and sort of getting through to eighteen, and then suddenly. If you've not hit the mark, or that's that's kind of you done. Absolutely. Then Absolutely. that's that's quite severe, isn't it? But um, before we get into that, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Finker and the Fusiliers. So these are the two band names. Um, what of, kind of music of, was it? It was indie rock and roll. Indie rock and um, roll. I uh, music is my first passion. Uh huh. Um, as is performance really so I love being a lead singer I was a songwriter and lead singer of, of the band for 12 years mm -hmm. um, and Fusiliers were the second band that I was mm -hmm. in uh, which was named after the Lancashire Fusiliers in, right. in Bury okay. but misspelt deliberately because that okay. was the cool thing to do uh -huh. um, these things come back and haunt you don't they um, <laughs> on, give, us the, give, us the, give us your best moment the best moment was walking out onto the new band stage at Glastonbury uh, on the on Saturday, we were third on the bill. Um, nice. My friends point out I very often tell people it was Saturday at eleven uh, at Glastonbury, but I need to just make people aware it was eleven a.m. not p.m. So <laughs> hey. pretty long way from headline slot, it's but it was the best moment. For it's sure. still a good story. It is good. It's good. Um, okay, so the first question I'm going to ask you is, um, what were you like at school? So I was, especially now I'm a dad and. Um, how irrational children can be. Um, I 
I think I was probably quite a lot of hard work, to be honest. I've always been somebody that likes to press uh, for change, that questions status quo, that argues, not for the sake of something, but does believe that there is a sort of creative juice that comes from, from argument, from expecting mm. differently, from expecting better. And I think I got um, a, lot of, a, a lot from that at school in absence of perhaps um, not meeting some of the expectations on me. Mm -hmm. Ironically, only in this job now I'm ac getting access to a number of experts within education and medical uh, fields. I realise I probably had quite a lot of legacy from having had meningitis and being comatosed. I had epilepsy as a child. I was on 15 years of, of drugs, daily drugs for, for that. So I suspect had a, a degree of attention deficit or learning difficulties. Um, but just as, the, just as the sugary drugs that kept me alive, um, they're now that you know th there's less sugar in those drugs now mm. um, so too is there better understanding in the classroom of how young people interpret um, information differently or perhaps respond better to mm. their environment if they're if they're given the attention that they that they need to enable to learn and that drives me uh, you you kindly refer to it as a drive for, for social justice absolutely right um, I was lucky enough to get this repeat opportunity that I've talked about and I don't believe that there should be there should be an absence of that in our school system mm. um, so that it, we cater for every child. I think one of the strongest um, lines about education in recent decades has been the every child matters uh, um, maxim, which I, I still go, come back to. And at the moment, I don't think we're getting that every child matters mm. approach to our, to our education system. Right, okay. And so uh, one of the things, uh, so we're gonna go on to the three things that you'd like to see uh, or that you'd like to talk about in schools in terms of things that perhaps aren't done particularly well at the moment, things that perhaps you would focus on more. And the first thing we've got down here is, um, well, I, I'm going to call it definitions of success. Okay. Uh, why is that something that you think needs addressing in schools? So I absolutely celebrate the need to reward academic performance and acknowledge academic ability in our school system. But this comes back to a principal view that schools have to be an ends in themselves in education, but also prepare young people for working life or active working life mm -hmm. and the rewards and the fulfillment that that can bring. And I don't believe that we have nearly enough of that at school in a system that is increasingly linear, headed towards a straightforward pass or fail experience at mm -hmm. school to divide to divide um, or define rather a child's experience at school as simply his or her performance within exam conditions. I don't subscribe to that, and I might I might argue I'm an example of that as somebody well, that, say, that yeah. didn't enjoy school for a variety of reasons, didn't especially perform in those conditions. I now find myself as Im as immodestly put as it can. I find myself now in a position. Um, of relative success as a yeah. member of parliament and on the prestige education. That, that we celebrate, you know, MPs and what they've achieved and that kind of thing. Uh, that, sure, quite possibly. But I think the point is that you shouldn't be telling young people uh, or defining young people on such a narrow scope um, of success or pass and fail as, as whether or not they've been successful. So that's very much personal experience, as in if that had been the case for yourself, then perhaps you wouldn't find yourself sitting here in the same sort of Absolutely. situation. Absolutely, and you know, there's, a, there's always gonna be a degree of personal responsibility, of self-determination, of how resilient you are. But I think some of those, um, some, in fact it was a school governor that pointed out um, to me that quite possibly the age at which I myself was ill at seven was quite possibly um, part of my recovery from that was the success of those first seven years that, I've, that I'd had in a, a right. loving environment. Mm. And that actually, um, that speaks to all the evidence of the reason why Sure Start was proving to be so successful, yeah, yeah. as to why actually quite a lot of our um, education and childhood um, spending should be the other way. We mm. have a far higher proportion of money spent on higher education yeah, than on yeah. early years, and I think those first five, seven years are absolutely fundamental to the mm. life chances of young people. And that's one of the things I, I commit to. Yeah. Um, but you talked about success, and I think we've got, we've got to expand what we define success as. And that, so at the moment, we're only defining it as academic success, generally. Uh, so so, so what, is, what, is, what is customary in this debate 
is for those that appear to be arguing for an expansive definition of success are doing so at the expense of saying English and maths mm. aren't important. Yeah. That's not true. No, no, That's no. not the argument that I'm making. The argument I think needs to be that we build on that, but that we, but that we make room to celebrate success of those who are not succeeding in those areas yeah. as well as, or, or, or instead of. Mm. And so we aren't, we aren't seeing that in our system. That isn't rewarded. And we're seeing a, a great number of young people excluded and mm. off-rolled as a result. But it also, this comes back to what we want from our school system, not just for the individual, but for a society. If we're putting out people who, for the first time in their life, their experience of working environment, of agile thinking, of adapting, of resilience, of commercial awareness, financial literacy, mm. is, is in the workplace, then it's no surprise we've, we've got a productivity problem and a skills gap in our wider economy. So mm. I, I think we've got, to, we've got to restore some childhood into our education system and then ask where are they going on to mm -hmm. and where is, where is their learning or in appreciation of that so ahead almost of like a, a broader base at the bottom you need to finance that so so children can understand a whole range of different opportunities and ways in which they can they can define their own success for example absolutely so right. that when they decide to go vertical absolutely right later down the road absolutely right i mean that it, it it brings up a question actually which i should have asked before and it is what what is the point of school that's a good question. It's a, it's a question I used to ask myself at school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Didn't think that, I think. Um, yeah. And I think that's the point, right? So I think, yes, we've got to celebrate the ends in itself that education provides mm. us. We've got to understand that um, a young person's intellect and ability is, is presented in different ways at different mm. stages, for sure. And there needs to be some patience, some dynamism in, in, our, yeah. in that system, which talks back to my um, repeat inclusive opportunity, inclusive repeat opportunity point. Um, that I made earlier, um, but yeah, we, we've got to ask what what is it we want from our schools, mm. and I think we need both a paradigm shift in in the funding in how we fund our schools, i.e., uh, determined by need and aims, as mm. opposed to simply this is what the country is giving schools, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually then say uh, and and also what are we preparing young people for when they leave mm. when they leave school? Yeah, because one of the things that we we talked about just before we hit record was uh you know we talked about things like the rise of the machines and and that plays very well sort of has a massive effect on how we define what schools are for yep um and you know i think there's all sorts of different opinions on, on that but how do you see the role of school in this kind of fourth industrial age how do you what do you what do so you see schools should be exciting young people about the future and the prospects of the future the reality is all the evidence shows us that you know two million jobs at a kind of modest estimate of low skilled uh, work will be taken by automation or robots within the next five to ten years um, now we should embrace that change but make sure we're not putting young people out from school and education into competing with um, robots with an ability yeah. to recite knowledge and perform repeat tasks at a level that humans at, just can't at achieve. A le uh, levels that human. So the argument is very often about at the expense of academic success. You want to do the soft skills. Mm. I think soft skills is a really obnoxious term for what are human hardwire. Yeah. Okay. So us versus robots celebrate ingenuity, creativity, engineering feat, mm. um, the ability to assess, the ability to empathise. Mm. Hugely important. Problem solve, so, critical thing. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, we, we will also be a determ the, the determination factor in the direction that we set for robots. So exactly. we need an ethical debate. We need um, a, a kind of moral code, if you like, built into that. We also need to avoid robots becoming, and, and automation becoming, or, or sorry, requiring a kind of civil rights movement for themselves mm. before the coding yeah. catches up with all the stuff we've already learned, that we, all, the, all the stuff we've learned for ages, mm. i.e. gender equality, race equality, sex equality, etc. Um, uh, but there is evidence quite early on that that isn't being that isn't being done. So schools need to prepare young people with the competitive edge that when they come out of school celebrates their humanity mm. as opposed to pits them against uh, the robots. Exactly, because that because that is that is the often the focus of the conversation, isn't it? It's very much the sort of us versus the machines and yep. this kind of yep. clash. Where, whereas actually, it's taking away the idea that 
we have the ability to shape and change those things in the way that we want. Absolutely, Absol and, and that a degree of self-determination for themselves. Look, mm. All of the early evidence is that automation and robots will enhance uh, one particular class or status of the mm. economy um, and poses real threat to the economic status uh, of, 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 of others, depending on where you stand in the economy. Mm. So the retail experience of using automation and AI and robots um, will be to enhance it. It'll be quicker delivery, it'll yeah. be faster turnaround, it'll be highly responsive or kind of modal shifts to your patterns because you like these particular types of trainers, yeah. et cetera. That's, that's an enhanced experience for you. But if actually you're the person doing the packing in the warehouse to be replaced by the robot, as a conversation that we have to have with our education and uh, wider economic um, uh, partners, we've got to say, actually, let's ensure that the customer service aspect is the thing we're concentrating on, yeah, that yeah. empathy, that yeah. responsiveness yeah. Um, and understanding on a human level mm. than, than, than actually expecting low skill work to continue which where is not. humans are alongside robots, which yeah. obviously none yeah. of us want. I mean, that takes us really nicely into our, the, the second thing that we were going to talk about with schools, which is curriculum. Yes. Um, and I've just got one word written down here, which is broader. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Needs yes. to be broader for a number of the reasons we've described already. Exactly. Um, which both is how we define success and how we prepare young people for meaningful, fulfilled lives mm. after school. Um, and I don't think we've got either right at the moment. Um, and uh, there's a wider argument being made at, at Education Select Committee level and ministerial level of, about that. Um, but the schools that I speak to um, would uh, all, all have an appetite to be able to offer a wider curriculum mm. at a time when they are being valued on a very narrow uh, performance table. Yeah, and, do you, and, and this kind of, the way that you described the education funding as being very, very top heavy. Yeah. Is this one of the ways in which you think that, you know, if there was a leveling out of that or even, you know, uh, you know flipping the other way, that would, um, be one of the ways in which we could actually fund that kind of broader curriculum because people will people will argue won't they that um, it'd be very nice to offer a broader curriculum but um, we probably need um, more teachers with different skills uh, probably need I don't know maybe uh, a wide it'd be, to be able to offer a wider variety of yeah. curriculum choices yeah. we need more money to do that we do and um We've, we've uh, you know, we, we meet at a time of the budget that's just gone where the Chancellor talked about little extras, which, you know, the education sector are still reeling mm. uh, the suggestion that there was, that, that everything was kind of rosy in the garden and that it's a little extra windfall mm. would, would be the sort of cherry on the cake. Mm. Uh, in reality, the kind of, um, uh, the situation is that that capital, that one-off capital funding won't come anywhere near the level of funding that we need to have a kind of enriched in spirit experience at school, mm. when school buildings, where toilet blocks, where curriculum enriching resources are are, are crumbling, you know, mm. um, and we've seen that near ten years of austerity mm. having taken its toll um, on head teachers. Um, and for, for for me though, this isn't about a funding uh, or it's it's. It, in addition to a funding argument, it is about a principle of, of what we include our, um, our, in, in our curriculum and then what we evaluate our schools as having been successful yeah. in achieving, um, as well as the young people's experiences whilst they're there. Right, okay. And the third thing we're gonna talk about is lifelong learning or repeat opportunity. So we've talked a bit about um, inclusive repeat opportunity or repeat inclusive opportunity. I, I, I like inclusive repeat opportunity. Um, we've uh, a really ugly emergence of off-rolling and exclusion. The town I represent is the top of the league for exclusions really? in the country. It's not okay. a league you want to be top of. It's certainly not mm. something um, you want to stay top of. So we're doing a lot of work in trying to understand that, supporting community groups, empowering parent groups, working with the local authority, raising the issue with ministers, asking the question at select committee. Um, and we've got a situation now where um, our young people are being, I think, systemically let down through a toxic mix of an Ofsted inspection framework, 
the ability which doesn't celebrate the which doesn't celebrate definitions of success definitions that of other success, people can achieve isn't patient isn't dynamic mm -hmm. isn't specifically seen as rewarding schools that take those principal views yeah. of demonstrating inclusivity repeat opportunity patience dynamism yeah. etc um, and that toxic mix then of that framework with the problem of funding and not enough of it and then also uh, the ability to cite other as a reason for off-rolling. So we've got an explosion off-rolling with yeah. one fifth of schools now able to put other as a description for excluding uh, a child. Right. So okay. I've met with um, the former children's minister this, this last month who's reviewing exclusions across the piece mm -hmm. to lobby for that to be changed. Um, I'm sympathetic to the reasons why schools are forced uh, or have their hand forced to exclude but I don't believe that one fifth of all exclusions should go with information unknown yeah, as yeah, to yeah. why they're bit, that's being um, that's that's happening. Mm. And so this idea of repeat opportunity, um, talk to us a little bit like about that because I think one of the things that really strikes me about what you're talking about is about how people develop at different times and different stages, and also people don't have. You know, some people will have their light bulb mo moments at the, you know, the age of sort of eight years old. Yeah. Some might have it when, uh, you know, choosing their GCSEs. Yeah. Some might have it at A level and then some might just, might not have it until they're, Absolutely. you know, 30, 40, 50 years old. Yeah. I think, you know, yeah. I mean, everyone's favorite. But, um, but, and, it's, and it isn't just about that light bulb moment. And um, for, for sure that that is a, a, a tra one trajectory. I think if you combine that some of the things we've spoken about, education, the kind of meaningful, fulfilled work, the threat and opportunity of uh, automation and robots. Um, we've got to, we, I think we've got to reevaluate the term lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to understand that uh, the way in which we enhance society um, through individual empowerment of uh, accessing lifelong learning and a, a young person or any person's evaluation of their role in in that in that changing trend is by um, an education system or lifelong learning education system which includes retraining and apprenticeships and degrees um, but also midlife late life learning yeah. reskilling self-directed learning self-directed well. is is not unlike that 20 years ago we were all, we would go to a variety of websites of a day for a variety of bits of information whereas now we understand that if we're on facebook or twitter we have self-selected in some instances or um, mm. advertising uh, cookies yeah. know where to find us as to what our interests are. Mm. Well, I think we need a system of lifelong learning that lets a, a young person or any person take some control in how they access that, that learning. So I, with the work that we're doing on the Education uh, Select Committee, I will be asking for the work of our skills plan inquiry to reevaluate the possibility of, of learner accounts of skills accounts, so individuals having a sense of this is this is an entitlement to learning, access learning, mm -hmm. either through um, the apprenticeship levy or uh, another uh, way, so that people who find themselves in work but want to develop and go on can access, can trigger funding that then puts them in control of where they fund, uh, of where they of where they learn next and what they learn and how. And would the argument be that by actually empowering people to do that? that they put less pressure on the system should they encounter sort of problems further down the line. This is kind of giving them a, a much more positive route, which means that they stay contributing to society, that they stay in control of that. Is that how you see? I, I would definitely see that. I think there is a, a more um, significant question, existential uh, threat, if you like, to some of the things we've spoken about and that transition, not least because robots won't be paying taxes mm. and you know our entire tax base and social just um, social security uh, system relies on on the taxes being paid of, of all levels of workers um, if they're replaced by non-tax paying robots mm. there'll be a transition period where that tax take dips unless we've got something to leap to yeah. which is so th these are some of the challenges that we're facing I think I and it, it's also why in education young people should have conversations about becoming entrepreneurs themselves, about ideas for their own business, about being bosses and employers themselves as opposed to simply going out into work. Yeah, I mean, and I mean that's something that you touched on quite early doors. And um, I can say that 
I never, I'm not even sure I heard the term entrepreneur until I was 30 plus. No. I had no, kind of no idea what it was and it was probably just something that people I didn't really know or associate with. Absolutely. Like had a thing. Absolutely. Had a well, thing Bury has just, Bury has just become, in, within Greater Manchester, the highest proportion per head uh, of entrepreneurs uh, in, in Greater Manchester are in Bury. So, so, so it's um, top of two league tables then? So, exactly. That, um, how, how does that unrelated I, I, I expect uh, well right. definitely unrelated but yeah it is top of two different league tables yeah but well, it speaks of two very independent spirits though as well though, it does it, it does so and there are very similar independent spirits th- there are just... a number of independent aspects to to Bury to Ramsbottom in particular which you know there will still be people in Ramsbottom that would um, claim to be part of Lancashire than Greater Manchester and mm-hmm. that's fair yeah. Um, but there is a there is a strong independent mindset. Um, to be honest, as a sort of adopted Mancunian, there's a pretty strong independent mindset to the Republic of Mancunia. Anyway, well, so it's a very northwest thing, that isn't it? It is it? because it is. being from Liverpool, I I was talking about that this morning on the phone to someone and talking about yeah, how yeah. The, it is that independent Republic of Liverpool, and absolutely. it is the same with Manchester. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And right. actually, it's in your family, isn't it? Because your your wife started her business in Ramy Market. She did, and um, you know, when you learn, you learn quite early on of, of not only uh, the graft involved of a market stall, but um, uh, the sort of honesty of it. It is, it is, these are goods that I am yeah. selling that you will pay and I will exchange and I will very make some face money. To face, very, very face to yeah. face. And I think we've lost a bit of that in our appreciation of, of the economy or the, you know, particularly when you've got sort of financial services selling products that no one really knows what they are, <laughs> what they do, and then a crash yeah. comes. Um, actually, you go back to Ramsbottom or Berry's world famous market, there are people making decent money, not enough perhaps in many cases, but decent money doing a good day's work and getting paid honestly for it. And I think we should celebrate that. Um, the next the next generation of that though includes young people uh, or all people setting up in business themselves, adopting uh, an appreciation of the technological age or creating online mm. uh, services. And the point I made in my budget speech is that there is still very, so a budget, uh, you know, Chancellor stands up and says, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z for small business. Uh, entirely framed within the confines of the high street, which mm. itself is going through significant change. And yet many entrepreneurs in Bury and those that I know, not least in my own family, are doing a day's work before they then log on and do their entrepreneurial stuff, mm. which is in part to top up because wages are stagnant, but in part also it's because they're creating an idea before they perhaps with the right backing go off and do it for themselves. And, 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 you know, it, it touches back in on these things that we were talking about in terms of definitions of success and Absolutely. curriculum. And do Absolutely. you feel like that kind of, I mean, because I, I um, didn't really understand the whole idea behind business and all the rest of it until I was sort of definitely mid 20s, early 30s, maybe. Yeah. And do you, do you think that given, given the changes in economy and the rise of machines and the fourth industrial revolution and all those kind of things, do you think a knowledge and an awareness and a sort of even um, you know a, being able to practice those kind of things at a much younger age is actually not just desirable but necessary necessary it's absolutely necessary um, we need a we need an economic uh, we need an economy that grows governments don't like risk but entrepreneurs thrive on risk right. turning risk into reward mm-hmm. and yet the generation of any new economic growth has to come with the kernel of an idea being put into practice. So yes, I will sell something on Ram's Bottom Market, was mm. to, to use my, my wife's experience, um, which involved you know hard graft, making a product, selling a product, development of a brand, mm. uh, which initially was based on character or personality uh, and the quality of the product. And then subsequently now in, in supermarkets and elsewhere, is a more is a is a, is a more developed um, product, a more developed concept. Mm. Much of that learning could be done at school, so that people would at least understand the value, or indeed the option for themselves, of that experience. And we don't do anything like uh, enough of that. I think as well, though, and this is why I talk about it not being about, about at the expense of the academic performance around maths and English. I think for a lot of people, including myself, a lot of people would benefit from that applied learning exactly. and the application of the pressure of making money or making ends meet or 
buying produce to sell explains very often you said yourself it's the mid 20s before you're learning about business mm. very often explains much of the reason why we would be learning these things in the first place mm. and i think that is a uh, is, is some pretty easy work we can do to join up the dots mm. i think it's very easy to lose a sense of purpose through when you're chasing results rather than 100 yeah. percent, absolutely right well uh, last thing I want to ask you about is what are you working on that you're currently most excited about? Well, I've got, I brought this, which is my uh, Living Well and I Dying Well. I was wondering why you'd place yes, it there. Yes. There we go. Living Well and Dying Well. Um, so this is, a, this is some work within the social care um, area of policy. Um, I uh, do a lot of work with Berry Hospice and have done for some years. Berry Hospice is actually underfunded by NHS levels but continues to get great will and support from the town. Mm -hmm. But across Greater Manchester, there is a great discrepancy between, or disparity between um, the hospices as to who funds what and how. What I'm calling for in this report is the integration more formally of hospices into the NHS to protect its charitable and nimble footed status because that's the sort of entrepreneurial aspect to it, mm -hmm. but that actually says with a firmer footing and better reliance as a sort of super sub by the NHS, then it becomes more sustainable because we shouldn't have a situation where our hospices in Bury, to use the example, but this applies to the seven in Greater Manchester, that there is a short list, uh, sorry, a waiting list rather, uh, of patients, uh, but a shortage of funding to open the beds for those patients mm -hmm. at a time when our social care problems exist largely because people are in beds in hospital, unable to move to a social care plan that's right for them. So this has been adopted now by Greater Manchester NHS following its launch last month. Um, and that is some substantial work. I've got a meeting with the social care minister next, next week uh, to go through the recommendations of the report. And um, I would anticipate within six to 12 months post launch, we'll be able to point at the at the improvements that we're making where hospices feel better uh, valued but actually are able to make some more substantial plans to play their part in the social care uh, offer that our NHS is, is providing our regions like ours particularly in Bury and Greater Manchester. Perfect well thank you very much All right. it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure I enjoyed that. So there we have it. That was the secret staff meeting with James Frith. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you thought about that. It's available uh, on all the channels. So just search for the secret staff meeting or look on Lip Film Fest uh, on YouTube or on Twitter.